Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Gianni here with Chris. How are you, Chris? I'm doing great. And welcome, everybody. Welcome to the second lesson of the Fundamentals semester. It's good to be here with you all. And uh, Chris here will be taking all of your questions. We hope that you will write in with anything that pops up, and we want to try to answer them all. And today we want to go ahead and start out with something that will kind of get our thoughts flowing in the right direction. To give us an aim, uh, this comes from a book called The Point in the Heart. It's from our teacher, Michael Lightman. Imagine being a newborn baby, your first sensation that someone is caring for you, a feeling that there is someone huge who shows his warm, caring, and benevolent feelings towards you. You cannot understand him yet but you know that he takes care of you, does everything that is good for you, and you are completely under his control. Thus, gradually, people will come to feel the caring and overseeing influence of the upper force, the only force in the world. The topic of today's lesson is called, Who Are You? Where Did You Come From? And Where Are You Headed? We feel ourselves in a world where we're not really sure what happens before us, before life starts, after death, and um, for most people, they just kind of live. Kabbalists ask the question, what are we actually doing here? It started thousands of years ago with the very first Kabbalist, Adam, and uh, then Abraham and many Kabbalists after that, and they were all just like you, just like me and Chris. They were regular people who began asking this question, what am I doing here in this world? Thousands of years of development have passed in civilization, and gradually all arrows start to point to there being a purpose, there being a design to reality. And in our times, especially recently, even I would say in the past 10 years, things start adding up to look like this whole process that we're in is actually not random. Um, it's It's got a plan to it. It's got a design. And even science starts to reveal this. That uh, even physicists tell us that there are over 200 laws, 200 finely, exquisitely tuned parameters that if any one of them will be even one billionth of a hair off, the whole universe can't exist. Not only can life not exist, but the entire universe that all came out of this single point called the Big Bang, which wasn't an explosion in the middle of space, but rather, as physicists discover, it was actually this point. We don't know what happened before this, and science also doesn't research this because what, there's nothing to research. But from this point called the Big Bang, everything, including the universe and everything that developed out of this initial seed, this initial point, it all came out of this single point. And out of this point also came these, you can say, what they've discovered so far, which is these 200 or more exquisitely finely tuned uh, parameters and laws that exist in reality. And there are other laws that we also don't know about yet but we're discovering more and more. And even the physicists are starting to say that when we look at this paradigm, when we look at this uh, picture of our evolution, of our development, of all of the animals that developed and the humans and the plants, that it starts to look more and more like uh, it's orchestrated. And we don't want to think that. Of course, science doesn't want to acknowledge that really, because why? Because if I acknowledge that there's a design, then automatically there's all of the creationist. It's kind of like a political thing. Like they want to say that the world was created 6,000 years ago and uh, God just kind of like zapped, you know, all of the animals into existence and there was no evolution. So we don't want to go in that direction. So it's very hard to admit this. But more and more, it looks like there's probably a plan. And when we look at all of the biological life, we've learned that the biosphere and the ecology is all tightly interconnected. And each and every animal is omnidirectionally connected to all of the others and interdependent. So it looks like this broad scheme of reality 
all fits together into one system. And also on a human level, within the past five years actually, they've done, they did a study that showed that human beings also are in our thoughts, some call it the noosphere, but in our thoughts, in our desires, we are all in this kind of ecosystem between us and people get fat together, people stop smoking together, people get happy together. Everything is interdependent through this interdependent web of unseen threads that exist between us. So from the human level to the animal level to the plant level and everything that was included that came out of this point of the Big Bang, it's all intertwined. There are laws that exist there that intertwine us. And this is where Kabbalah really can be revealed to the world because Kabbalists attained this whole reality above space and time. What does it mean? Also, physics says there's no space and time. To put it in the words of Einstein, it's an optical delusion of our consciousness. And what it means is that one who attains spirituality attains this whole picture above that optical delusion, meaning above the ego, and attains the entire reality, meaning from the start which is, let's say it's the Big Bang, but actually there is something prior to the Big Bang, and all the way to the completion. And a Kabbalist rises above this reality and views it all as one system, and then tells us that, yes, in fact, what those scientists are saying, that it looks like a design, it looks like there's a purpose. Yes, in fact, there is a purpose to it all. And Kabbalists begin to tell us what that purpose is. And we don't, we don't need to believe Kabbalists, what they say, but they, they tell us, look at reality, look at what science is discovering, and also take this as a hypothesis, what we're saying, and start researching yourself. We're going to give you ahead of your research a few principles that you can begin checking, and you need to check it in a special environment that's called a group, a teacher, and special books that are kind of like guidebooks, like GPS for the soul, let's say, that we can go into these books and they kind of tell us a few steps ahead where we need to start if we want to discover this upper reality, where we need to start researching, how we need to start checking our, our desire, our relationship to reality, our approach to life, and how we can bit by bit begin feeling what they are talking about. So let's go to one of the great Kabbalists, uh, Yehuda Ashlag, known as Bala Sulam, which means master of the ladder, because he wrote the ladder commentary on the book of Zohar, meaning he brought it down to a level that anybody can basically use this book, if it has this commentary, can use this book to make a spiritual ascent. Whereas prior to uh, Bala Sulam, the books of Kabbalah were written in such a way that only, a, only one who was studying next to a Kabbalist and who received the approach to these books, meaning I need to be formatted in a certain way, and then I need to use the books, I need a special approach, and then I can actually use them for self-change. And without being given this approach, receiving this approach from the Kabbalist, I'm not able to actually use it. <clears throat> It's like if I'll take a, I'll give a car to uh, some native person who lives on some island and never had any contact with humanity. They'll use it for a house, maybe for shelter, but not to drive. So this is basically the way people throughout history, the many scientists from Leibniz to Newton and Pythagoras and Plato, they all tried to use the books of Kabbalah, but they didn't receive this approach. So they didn't know how to use it. So let's go ahead and get into this uh, writing of Bala Sulam, and it is on page 565 from this book, Kabbalah for the Student, if you have it. If you don't have it, you should have it. Preface to the Wisdom of Kabbalah, item one. The thought of creation was to delight the creatures in accordance with his abundant generosity for this reason, 
a great desire and craving to receive his abundance was imprinted in the souls. The will to receive is the clea, vessel, for the measure of pleasure in the abundance. Since the measure and strength of the will to receive, the abundance precisely corresponds to the measure of pleasure and delight in the abundance. So I want to read that again, but we can already, as we're reading this, we don't want to take it just as some esoteric uh, philosophy or something, but rather we can already start feeling on ourselves or at least trying to feel what the Kabbalist is talking about. Uh, we can already feel that for us, for human beings, our whole pursuit, everything that we do in life is basically to become happier, to become better off, to become at the very least more comfortable or even less, if not more comfortable, to at least not suffer. Even if you feel yourself kind of how you're sitting right now, you're in the most comfortable possible of all positions. And in another moment, I'll move, and it's because I felt that more comfortable. And I'm not a, and if you see a whole room full of people, you'll see that each and every one has a different sense of what's more comfortable, but each and every one is trying in each and every state to be as comfortable as possible, to suffer as, le as little as I possibly can. And if I can get to the state where I'm not suffering, only then I start really thinking very seriously about how I can improve my situation, how I can maybe even be happy. You know, many people are looking for happiness these days, but uh, it's not that everybody is like ostensibly searching for happiness because most people are engaged in, first of all, how to not suffer. The point is, is that our essence is a will to receive, a will to receive fulfillment. So first of all, not to suffer, and later on in the spectrum, to receive pleasure. And this is good. And why is it good? Let's read the quote one more time. Okay. The thought of creation was to delight the creatures in accordance with his abundant generosity. For this reason, a great desire and craving to receive his abundance was imprinted in the souls in other words, this will to receive, which is our essence, was given to us. This is the essence of creation. And the fact that we feel ourselves kind of randomly developing through, you know, billions of years and then thousands of years in human society. So this is from above. And this whole societal direction of development and history, it's all in pursuit of how we can be more and more comfortable, and maybe even be happy. The will to receive is the clea, vessel, for the measure of pleasure in the abundance, since the measure and strength of the will to receive the abundance precisely corresponds to the measure of pleasure and delight in the abundance. So there's a law in reality, which is that... So just like we said, there are 200 uh, principles that the universe can exist on. So there's another principle. And this principle, this law, which is going to sound very obvious to you, but Kabbalah is a science, so we like to really overanalyze it and scrutinize it so that we can sense where uh, we can be more fulfilled, right? Um, and this law is that there is no pleasure without a desire. If I uh, have a chain smoker, let's say, chain smoker gets on a plane, 15 hours later, he wasn't allowed to smoke the entire time, give him a cigarette. Let's say he's out of cigarettes and I'm the one to give him the cigarette. I am suddenly his best friend. Okay, he loves it. If I go to a non-smoker and I who just got off that same plane and I give her a cigarette, she's going to be disgusted by it. She can't even stand the smell of it. Or let's say we have a nice Thanksgiving dinner and everybody's stuffed to the brim. Mom really pushed like the seventh, you know, course of dessert on us. What do we want now? After all this wine and goodness that we were looking forward to for days because Thanksgiving was coming up, we want sleep. We've already exhausted that desire. The, the pleasure met the desire and put the desire out. And now we need to go to a new desire. 
for sleep. And let's say that now I suddenly, I suddenly, the doorbell rings and we all go to the door. Who is it? Gianni ordered pizza. There's boxes of pizza. Is anybody going to be appreciative of this otherwise savory, delicious pizza? Obviously not. Why? No desire. So it's a very simple principle in, in theory that if I don't have a desire, I can't enjoy. So this is why it's said that the creator gave us this desire. Also creator, I don't know what creator is. It's maybe uh, something we're not, we'll, we'll get into it later, but it's definitely not what is commonly believed and we don't have to believe. And it's also okay if we believe already, but this, uh, whatever this, this is, this um, initial force that sets into motion this entire plan of creation that humanity is developing through, it imprinted in us this desire to receive the abundance because the purpose of creation was to fulfill the entire creation with infinite abundance. Therefore, we have this lack that is called the will to receive. So let's move on. Can I back up just yeah. for a second? Uh, there's something that uh, I would really like to express, and that is that Kabbalah also talks about something very important could come about because of people coming together. And they, we will go into this a lot all the way through your, uh, all the teachings of Kabbalah. So basically, in a roundabout way, what I'm asking for is let's start a process going right now of coming together. And whenever you come to a class, whether it's from San Francisco or it's from L.A., St. Louis, whoever's given the uh, class at that time, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and put in your name uh, and where you're from, uh, just to give the sense to other students, it's a start of something that's going to be very, very important. So whenever you come into a class, please, if you don't mind, I'm asking you for a favor, just put your first name, where you're from, and we'll go on from there. And I, I know as we go along, you'll learn more about why we're asking you to do this, and it'll become something very special uh, and very deep for all of us. So please do so. Uh, and another thing is, you don't know Gianni and I at all, and you don't even know who's on the screen right now. And everybody's afraid to ask a question. It's sort of like, well, do you mean this, Gianni, or do you mean that, or... Um, you know, what the heck is going on here? I didn't understand this or whatever it is, but I'm afraid to ask because it may be a so-called silly question. There's no silly questions, mm -hmm. people. Uh, feel comfortable. Uh, part, of, part of this is that uh, we need to come to a very safe and secure environment. And uh, please, by all means, ask any question that we're speaking about at the time. There's no big, no small, whatever it is. But please start with simply putting down your name whenever you come into a class, where you're from, and as time goes on, I think you'll understand more why I'm asking you to do that. Yeah, so. I just want to continue what Chris is saying, that um, no matter what people are engaged in in this world, uh, whether you're a scientist like my wife, or you're a CEO, or a rock star, or whatever you're doing in life, all of these pursuits, basically, even if they're the most intellectual, your Einstein, all of these pursuits have behind them this basic desire for fulfillment. Somebody like uh, Steve Jobs, if you remember how he dressed, he always wore what, a black shirt and jeans. To Steve Jobs, you really uh, you couldn't impress him with like a Louis Vuitton something, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> For him, the excitement in life and the way he received his pleasure was to, you know, redefine how the whole world kind of connects and like redefine their lives. For another person, it's to discover something in a laboratory. For another person, something else. But in short, it's all a pursuit of pleasure. And one who can do fancy math equations, it's because they're on fire while they're doing it. It's exciting to them. So what do I want to say? that when it comes to the wisdom of Kabbalah, nobody is smart. And because we're talking about how to be fulfilled, it's, you've probably heard that the wisdom of Kabbalah is the wisdom of how to receive. That currently, if we look at society, we see that people generally are not happy 
and all you know the world trade organization world health organization says that by 2020 depression will be the number one illness in the world so that just goes to show as much as people are happy on the outside so called that in truth it's a problem of how to receive so this is why the wisdom of kabbalah can be revealed today and what i want to say is just to compliment what chris said is that there's no smart even though i started out with physics and all of this there's no smart here it's all just to create support for this basic pursuit which is how can we truly be fulfilled this is what the wisdom of kabbalah is about and by the same token if you have questions or you felt like i said something kind of screwy you know ask it in the form of a question and we'll be happy to uh, follow up on that <laughs> So what you're trying to say is no matter what type of geek you are, a computer geek, a sports geek, or whatever you are, and you look at the other person as kind of strange or whatever it is, you'll find out that you're more similar than you ever thought you were. And when it comes to the wisdom of Kabbalah, everyone is basically mm -hmm. equal. Everybody has the same potential to advance. Those who became Kabbalist, and a Kabbalist discovers, first of all, all of the sciences because science really it's not divided into this chemistry physics this is just because we have small brains we use four percent of our brains and one single person can't process it all uh, why do we have that other 96 percent whatever it is this is so that we can develop this spiritual uh, we can use it for spiritual advancement and when of course when the wisdom of kabbalah opens to a person it's called the opening of the eyes of course then you use this entire brain so even a simple person he can be many kabbalists had very simple jobs in life but when they came to the wisdom of kabbalah and they had this opening of the eyes uh, called crossing the barrier into spirituality they understand all of these sciences and it's not smart and they're not going to know you know with the the latest jargon that they invented two years ago but they do understand this general system how it works because it's all one interconnected desire that's lawfully connected and the more you advance the more everything becomes simple so that was a little digression, but let's go back to Bala Salam, to the next quote. It is on page 567, preface to the Wisdom of Kabbalah, item 4. The expansion of the light and its departure makes the Kli fit for its task. This means that as long as the Kli has not been separated from the light, it is included in the light and it is annulled within it like a candle in a torch. So what does that mean? It means that we have a series or an arrangement of possible desires in this world that include food, sex, family, money, power, respect, honor, and knowledge. So we have the basic desires that every animal has, and then we have the social desires, so food, sex, family, and then money, money, honor, knowledge, these are uh, and power these are social desires that only exist if we're living in a society and all of these exist in potential sort of like little seeds let's say they start out as points they start out as points and even if these points get bigger and bigger so even if I'm a little baby, let's say, okay, let me label them. So let's say you have food, sex, family, money, power, honor, knowledge. And when I'm born, these desires are basically as a point. Food, even. For a baby, it starts out very small. It's only for mom's milk. Later on, you can introduce other things to it, you know, some porridge, some peas, some pureed carrots. Later on, we can get into, uh, you know, whiskey, cognac, all of this fun stuff, ribeye steak, let's say. But to a baby, that's disgusting. A ribeye steak <laughs> and a cognac is disgusting, right? Obviously. Uh, and why? It's because I need a desire in order to 
Well, that's the first principle we talked about. But besides needing a desire, I need the pleasure to enter, enter me once, and then gradually as the pleasure leaves, it creates the vessel. It creates the desire. Uh, let's use the smoking example again. Anybody who tried a cigarette for the first time, it's disgusting, right? Even the, the biggest chain smoker, the first time, it was, it was gross. Later on, they go through other stages where they gradually, they, because they had it and then it left and then they had it and then it left and then they had it and it left, this builds the desire. And it's the same way when you're feeding a baby. The first time we fed my baby, I have two kids, one is uh, six months. The first time we fed her an avocado, she gave this like disgusted look and gradually she started liking it, missing it, liking it more. And this is the way all of our desires work. That first of all, we need we need the pleasure, or as Kabbalah calls it, the light. We need the pleasure to come and create the desire. Though we start out with a point. We start out with a point, meaning a possibility, a seed that can grow into something. And as this pleasure develops the desire, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Food, sex, and family... Our animal desires, money, power, knowledge, these expand from within the society that the more we feel them and the more we've experienced them and had to do without them and then gotten them a little bit more and then had to do without them, the more our desire grows. So this is what Bala Sulam wants to say. And let's, yep. Are we going to go to a clip right now? I, we, I, we, we need to check some technology here, Johnny. Oh, sure. You, I'm sorry to interrupt everybody, but somehow we're not being connected somehow. Or Well, let's go uh, to a clip then, actually. That's a good idea. Yeah, let's go to a clip, and then we'll try to figure out uh, what's going on here. Do you want to introduce the clip really, very quickly? No, it's okay. We have a clip that is about exactly what we're talking about, which is adhesion with the creator, which is the ultimate purpose. And this is a clip by our teacher, Dr. Michael Lightman, and let's check it out. I'm sending messages to Amy and everything else. The Vakut, adhesion. It means that I'm included, nullified equalize to the point where there is nothing left besides the attribute of bestow the same as the creator has it rides upon my will to receive but my will to receive it does not separate between us but the attribute of bestow which I have acquired it is truly like the creator and then it means that we are adhered Hmm. Hold on just one second, friends. I'm not exactly sure how to get to that. What's happening right now is we're not getting any, any from um, from you or from Annie or. We're, we're just not getting any feed right now, and we're trying to solve the problem. Um, ah, here we go. Good. Nice. All right. We're back on. So uh, <laughs> we haven't answered any of your questions because we haven't seen any of your questions, but we'll get to them uh, very quickly. Um, and let's see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> mm. How about Warwick from South Africa? Okay, you play with that. I'm going to play with this right now. Hey, Warwick, how are you doing? Is it because of the ego that suffering comes about? 
If so, how can we prevent that? It's a good question, and it's true that the only reason why we feel suffering in our lives is because we have this ego. And the ego is not the basic will to receive that, uh, that we spoke about. The will to receive that the Creator created is in order for us to be able to feel the pleasure, as we said, because there's no light without a kli, as Kabbalists say. There's no uh, desire. Try to unplug and then replug yeah. this here. There's no, <laughs> there's no desire without, there's no light without a kli. So without feel, without having first a desire, we can't enjoy. If we look at the diagram, we see that when it comes to food, sex, and family, um, these are not considered egoistic. In fact, even money, power, honor, and knowledge are not considered egoistic. It only depends how we use them. So the fact that I have a general desire to receive pleasure or even that I want people to respect me or for me to have power or to have a lot of knowledge, this is not considered egoistic. It's only that I gauge myself with respect to what other people don't have. <clears throat> meaning I have a billion dollars in an account. I have so many zeros in my account I don't know what to do with. And for me, they really do nothing. They just sit in the account there. I don't know what to do with them. And But for me, the pleasure, because I can only enjoy so much in life, what can I really enjoy? Another another fancy restaurant, another French laundry, you know, another bottle of wine, more si – okay, how much can I really enjoy? With this body, I'm very limited with what I can enjoy. So how does humanity devise a new way that we call the egoistic way of enjoying? It's that I have more than you. And in my social circle, I feel myself higher than others. And I couldn't stand to be around others if I couldn't feel that at least in something, I'm a little bit better than them. This is what's called the ego. This is the source of all suffering in life. And that's exactly the, the, but it's also not a bad thing. We need, we don't need to get rid of this. Rather, we need to take this huge egoistic desire and we need to learn to use it in the proper way. And what does it mean to learn? It means that in the wisdom of Kabbalah, there's something that calls, is called the light that reforms. That as huge as a person's desire is, in fact, the, the more huge this desire is, the more I will later be able to use this in order to bestow. So I will be able to use exactly that so-called evil desire as my spiritual capital. That that egoism, I invert it to be in order to bestow. And by this, I come into a I, I balance my ego with the general law of love and bestowal, which is called the creator. Is there another question? Earlier you were mentioning books. Uh, one of our uh, areas that we can be tied to are books. Uh, you say books in the plural. What are the other books besides the Zohar? The books that we study, first of all, all of the books that Kabbalists ever wrote were written from a state of spiritual attainment, meaning they're written from above what's called the barrier or the maksom. So they wrote from that state, but they wrote usually just for other Kabbalists, meaning if I'm in spiritual attainment and Chris is in spiritual attainment and I write a book that is meant for him. So this is the, the way that all of the books until Bala Sulam were written. They were not intended for people who are not in spiritual attainment. And the only way to come to spiritual attainment through those books, which have no other purpose than being such a guidebook, was if I would be one of those select students that Kabbalists sought out and uh, were looking for, and I would be one-on-one -on -one with him or actually in a group with him, and he would give me the general approach. Those books, the ones, well, okay, let me answer like this. 
prior to the RE, Isaac Luria, who was in the 16th century, 15th, 16th century, there were Kabbalists such as the Ramak and others and other books that Kabbalists would exchange among themselves that are completely esoteric and no one can understand unless they're in attainment. After the R, actually Ramak and Ari, they were contemporaries. Ramak was the big dude in Safat. And when the Ari came to Safat, everyone stopped studying from the Ramak. The Ramak even went into Ari's class. This is an old man uh, who was a huge Kabbalist, but he was from a previous era. Previous era, meaning an area, an era in which it does not belong to the general correction of humanity. Ramak sat before this young 20-something uh, Kabbalist and started learning from him because he belonged to the generation already 500 years ago of the final correction. So after this, people studied only the Ari and the Zohar, and the Ari's uh, words were meant to illuminate the Zohar. After that, there was a Kabbalist by the name of the Baal Shem Tov, but he didn't write anything. He gave everyone a method, meaning he worked. He had, jet, he had several Kabbalists in various cities, and he, they were his students, and he had this broad network, and there was layers. There were circles around the Baal Shem Tov that went from his inner, inner Kabbalistic students to a little more outer circle to those who were outside who were just generally religious and uh, because they weren't ready to study the wisdom of Kabbalah. They were ready to keep customs and so on. So the, by way of root and branch, they gave them kind of a religion just to kind of keep people united, keep people happy and joy. They also studied the Ari and the Zohar. <clears throat> but again, this was only in a Kabbalistic group. From then on, really, everybody only studied the Ari and the Zohar and a few other Kabbalists. Today, what we can advance from and what Bala Sulam prepared for us, meaning he, advanced, he, he did what no Kabbalist ever, ever did. Meaning you have all of these books which are written from the state of the upper world and only talk about it. And here you have us. And Bala Sulam, what does it mean that he's called master of the ladder? So he built essentially a ladder through which any person could reach the minimal first spiritual degree and cross this barrier. And then understand everything that is written in these books. So the books that we study... We study, it's like if I go to Europe, I need for my iPhone or whatever, I need a special plug to plug in. Otherwise, my beautiful iPhone is just completely worthless there. And it's the same way with respect to how we are built internally, that we can only use the texts of the Kabbalists with the adaptation that we get from the Kabbalist who was able to write in such a way as to adapt it for us. So we read, actually, all, the entire canon of Kabbalistic literature. You'll hear Ka uh, Bala Sulam quoting from the Talmud, quoting from the Torah, quoting from the Zohar, and he also has his entire Zohar commentary, which we read from. The entire study of the Ten Sfirot, which we will get into, and which we study on a daily basis with our teacher, Dr. Lightman. This is a organization of the writings of the RE because the writings of the RE were also disorganized and written in such a way that there's no system. There's no way that I can come from where I sit and gradually begin to feel my way into the upper world. So we study the writings of the RE, but through Bala Sulam, we study the Zohar, but with this latter commentary, which translates it, which it adds a commentary to the Zohar, which 
everybody from previous generations, because it didn't have this commentary, thought it was about angels, demons, the Garden of Eden, all types of things. These are all phenomenon that occur within me. And Bala Sulam adds this language of the Ari that is in the language of Sfirot and parts of theme and worlds. And this doesn't let a person make a mistake and thus in advance in a completely wrong direction to spirituality. It uh, screws me up if I want to, you know, think it's about all these angels and demons because Bala Sulam jumps in and says, no, it's about Malhut rising to Bina. He translates it into a language that doesn't allow us to get confused. Even though we're still confused, it doesn't allow us to get it into a confusion that leads away from the goal. So Bala Sulam is a very, very practical Kabbalist who adapts all of these for us. And then there are the writings of Rabash. And Rabash talks about the same stuff as Bala Sulam, but he expands his work and makes it even more relevant to our lives and how we work with this entire method, Rav, group, and books. So long story short, we study the Zohar, we study the writings of the RE, and we study all of the other texts such as the Talmud and so on, but we don't study that directly. We study the parts that are organized into this system that we can work from where we are in our lives like normal people and receive an explanation and receive the right flow and reach what the Kabbalists attained. No such luck. <laughs> okay. So let's go back to the text. Let's go to the next text because uh, we didn't quite get to where we need to get to. So when they are bound together, the will to receive is annulled in the light. Within it and can determine its form only once the light has departed thence once. This is so because following the departure of the light from it, it begins to crave it. And this craving properly determines and sets the shape of the will to receive. The will to receive is the whole substance of creation from beginning to end. Thus, all that exists in reality, even if you take atoms and you put what atoms are attracted to next to them, you will see that they're all flocking that way or electrons or obviously plants, you see that they grow towards the sunlight. They, everything in reality is this will to receive that is trying to feel itself in constantly in a slightly better state. More comfortable, less suffering, more comfort, possibly more pleasure, if, 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 if at all available. And this is the entire substance of creation. So it's an it's not just something psychological that I'll uh, switch from a will to receive to a will to bestow. No, this is imprinted in every atom, every DNA particle. It is completely the entire reality, a will to receive. So let's continue. So the will to receive is the whole substance of creation from beginning to end. Thus, all the creatures all their innumerable instances and conducts that have appeared and that will appear are but various measures and various denominations of the will to receive. So let's kind of draw what we what Kabbalah says we have. Um, first of all, we have, let's say, this point of the Big Bang. And then matter starts developing for billions of years. In other words, what do we mean by matter? The will to receive, the desire to receive pleasure develops. And this is how all of the gases form and the simple matter, the atoms form, the, and they form into molecules, single cellular, multicellular organisms, plants, animals, humans. Then we start developing until a few million years ago, and then say 10,000 years ago, society started developing, and we start developing through all of these desires for food, sex, family, and then once in society, we develop desires for money, power, honor, knowledge,
So here's the Big Bang. No. Here's the Big Bang. From which all of matter began. And we said that Kabbalah also talks about what happened before the Big Bang. So we learn that we started out in one state, one unified state, where all of reality was one, not just connected, but as one. Say this is the first state. And here we are like a baby in its mother's womb. A baby in its mother's womb has everything. It receives an infusion, a little IV of anything that its body should need in order to develop. And this is like the first state. We're in adhesion with this preliminary force called the creator, but we don't really feel it. A baby doesn't know where it's at. It doesn't necessarily appreciate that it's good there because it has no contrast. For reasons that we will discuss from this state and because the creator wanted to give us infinite fulfillment, and we have no desire for the fulfillment if we're in this embryonic state. We fall down through five worlds. And these five worlds are called Adam Kadmon, Atsilut, Briah, Yetzira, Asiya. What are these five worlds? They are gradual concealments of this this perfect, infinite state where there's no people, everything is all one, it's completely interconnected, beautiful, in adhesion, we don't feel any lacks, it's perfection. And we gradually conceal this through these conceal concealments called worlds until we reach this shattering that's called the Big Bang. And it's not, as I joked earlier, like the creator zaps, you know, the, I shall create a zebra, I shall create a cow, I shall create a man. Nothing is like this in nature. And you'll discover that Kabbalah is completely in line with science, that it's all scientific, everything that you will discover in reality through evidence, through experiment, there's definitely some truth to it. And everything follows evolution, though it's not really a science, right? Because what they discover archaeologically, that's science. But if you take the whole story that's been added to, uh, you know, that we philosophically say it's like uh, we think they develop like that, it's science, but not science in regard in by the standards of any other science. Meaning, if you try to call these what our story of evolution to a physicist or to a chemist. It means you can, science means that you can repeat it in a lab, see how it works, check it if it really works the way you think it is, and we can't do that because it's billions of years ago. So we will gradually clarify this. Scientists themselves will discover this, and Kabbalists also uh, tell us that everything works in this evolutionary way, meaning in a process of development of stages that one thing leads to the next and one degree evolves into a higher degree and a higher degree and this whole thrust of evolution including the social evolution in society it's all aiming us into one general realization inner work to discover this purpose for which we exist and gradual climbing back up to something that we truly every single human being longs for, but unconsciously, which is, let's say here's the second state, which is our world. And you have the third state, which is roughly equal to the first state. 
So we who are in our world, every single person has a point in the heart, which is the point in the heart is something that longs for this. It wants to go home. Only in most people, it is concealed to such an extent that it's still covered by these desires. What does it mean covered? Not only covered, but covered in the sense of, I'm covered, I'm good. I I first need to attain money and then power. I'm not worried about this point that's longing for something. Who knows what? I have many things to worry about and many enjoyments to still try to get something out of. A person with a point in the heart also wants to enjoy, but knows deep down that no matter what you'll give me, even if you'll give me billions of dollars, fame, whatever you give me, I still long for something. I feel stuck in this reality and I long for something. What is the purpose of it all? So I'll enjoy. So I'll control everyone in the world. So I'll design an iPhone that everybody uses. Okay, I'll take it, please, and the billions of dollars. But then what? I still have this curiosity, this wondering, what am I here for? And I somehow know Even if it's not completely clear to me, I somehow know that nothing will fulfill me, nothing in this world. Because this this point, this point in the heart that awakens, all of this belongs to the heart. And this point in the heart longs for this. And this, why does it long for it? Because this point in the heart is a point that knows that this pleasure is something that nothing can compare to, that's billions of times greater, such that if I would feel it, as Bala Sulam said, if I would feel what it is, adhesion with the Creator, there is no person who wouldn't be willing to saw their own arms off seven times a day, to feel it even for a second. So we can just philosophize about it, we don't know what it is, but this point in the heart is a point that does. It is if knows there's something like that it forgot it's like it has me and chris gave a lecture the other day he said it's it's like i have amnesia and that's exactly what it is this point in the heart is like something that's like remembering like where am i what am i what am i doing here we're back on again okay okay and we have another question from shirley if kabbalah is not judaism then why do we read from the torah and the talmud it seems that Kabbalah in its original form at least is connected to Judaism. Kabbalah is not connected to Judaism, but I'm just spoiling the surprise for you that when you open the books of Bala Sulam and you see that he's quoting from this rabbi said this, that Rav said that, of course this comes from um, the Talmud or such texts <coughs> or Kabbalistic texts which at their uh, at their base is, let me, I'll draw it. So you have, first of all, maybe we keep it on the same drawing, if there's space. So you have 5,000 years ago, 5,775 years ago, you have somebody called Adam, and he was a person just living like a beast, like everybody else was living like beasts. And he started ask. he had this awakening of the point in the heart, and he started asking, what is the meaning of my life? And he also wrote a book called Angel Raziel. It's very difficult, but uh, he wrote a book. There was another one called Abraham. And besides the, besides the Abraham that is described as a persona in the Torah, there was a Kabbalist called Abraham who wrote a book called uh, Sefer Yetzirah, which is the book of creation, and it is in the language of Sfirot. And his followers were those who wanted to hear his message. And what was he teaching? He was teaching the wisdom of Kabbalah. Now, when a per, I'm going to jump to the point because I want to answer some other questions. And I think we have a whole lesson about this. Uh, but when a person attains spirituality, they attain a process, an inner process of coming to adhesion with the creator. 
meaning inverting this egoistic will to receive that we really need because we need to be able to invert it, but there is a special method for inverting it. And there are inner processes that can be described in a variety of languages. We're going to talk later about why there are these four languages through which they can be described. And one of them is called the language of the Torah. And so this whole story that a person goes through is where he discovers inside himself or herself inner qualities that I don't yet identify. Right now I can identify a desire for a chocolate milkshake or a desire for sex, but I can't identify a desire called Abraham. Moreover, I can't desire, I can't discover within me desires called Jews that followed Abraham and a desire called Moses and their interconnections and how there are different layers of desires that are still vegetative, animate, and speaking, and how because I'm working with all of these desires in order to flip my desire, to invert it from in order to receive to an intention to bestow, I actually need all of these different desires. And there's a, there's a saying also in the Talmud that everyone should write their own Torah. In religious practice, because Jews were not in spiritual attainment because they were in what's called an exile. They had just the external manifestations of what were really inner processes. And therefore, every person was, should write their own Torah literally meant that each and every little child would write their own Torah. This was part of growing up. And what it really means is that I discover this whole process of the Torah inside of me, and we can describe it in other languages. But all of this was concealed because humanity was in a state, as I just said, they were in a state where food, sex, family, money, power, all knowledge, I'm covered. That's all I need. I don't need anything else. I don't need the upper world. Therefore, they had no business with the wisdom of Kabbalah. But they could still somehow receive something from religion. Because religion is something that doesn't obligate me in this world to dedicate my life to discovering the meaning of life. I will do it when I die. The, the creator will be there and I'll be good and I'll be in heaven or whatever. So therefore, humanity in the meantime could go through this whole dynamic process of evolution of going from desire to desire. One short circuit, oh, that didn't work out. Another short circuit, that didn't work out. Let's change the political systems. Let's change the social systems, economic systems, until we come to this conclusion that we're not meant to be on this pleasure chase. There is a purpose to life. And we can go through this process with at least a good feeling that after I go through this whole process, the creator will be good to me because at least I kept these customs and those I can do. That I am capable of investing in. Therefore, the Kabbalists, like good parents, gave humanity these and gave especially the Jews and then later Christianity took some of them and also Islam and many other methods also take the same same approach and take this and that kind of a la carte but they gave them something that would keep sustain them and really humanity needed this religion and still needs this and it serves a purpose and it's not useless or worthless it's good and um, gave them something that they could use and feel good and develop. Humanity without religion is truly like uh, wild beasts. It's fascism, it's Nazism, it's, it's really something very bad. So Kabbalists gave humanity, and it's also said that uh, Abraham gave his sons, he gave them partial Kabbalah and sent them east. So this was 5,000 years ago, that more than 5,000, that, that uh, the Kabbalists spread drop by drop these different methods throughout the world, including the religions, and it was no accident. 
it was all part of the plan. But today, we're not studying religion. We need to back up a bit and we need to go to the true wisdom of Kabbalah. And we need to, if I come to something that uh, is called the Torah, it will be because I discover it inside of myself. And we use all of these different languages for flavor so that we can get into it. So we have a bit of the Torah. We have a bit of uh, this other language. And we look at the connection between them. And this is what I was saying. Bala Sulam's commentary on the Zohar is because the Zohar sounds like it's just a commentary. It's like an expansion of the Torah story. So people, again, think it's about what? History. But now instead of just being a history like it was in the Torah, now it's also got angels and demons. So Bala Sulam contrasts it with this additional language of the Sfirot. So you'll be confused again and you won't think that you know what it's about. And you will thus be forced to decide that it, it's about my inner work. It's not about something in this world. It forces me to search in the right place inside of me so that I can discover the purpose of creation, that I can discover what Kabbalah is discovered. That's why I said at the beginning of class that everything we're saying now is like a hypothesis, that everything that Kabbalists say, they want me to discover on myself, start searching within me. If I think it's a external customs that they're talking about, Jewish customs or something that happens after I die, then I don't start searching within myself. So we're also not saying religion is bad and don't do it and it's silly. We're saying it's good for humanity. But those who need to search, those who are ready to discover this on themselves, will come to those same discoveries that caused Kabbalists to say, first of all, never mind religion, to even say that there was such a thing as a creator. Because I will discover that upper force which creates reality, creates the reality that I was in. And that's why I'll say, so anyway, that's a very long explanation, but... Uh, so it's good. It was needed. Um, I'd first like to give everybody a hello from all of the students right now. Uh, I apologize. We were offline for a bit and so forth. But hello to everybody from Aaron, Eric, Laura, Northman, Adam, Miriam, Namat, Shur, Aaron, uh, William, Warwick, uh, and it just keeps on going. And students from all over Europe, Africa, uh, the United States, and to Canada, uh, welcome everybody. All right, perfect. So let's do maybe some more questions. Okay. Um, Does Kabbalah teach or recommend a type of meditation as a means for us to adhere to the Creator? Who's asking? Uh, this is Shirley from okay. Illinois. Uh, if so, what is the style of meditation that Kabbalists practice? Okay. So I'm going to answer in two ways. First of all, no meditation in Kabbalah. Why? Because what people mean by meditation is something insufficient. Because what does meditation mean? <clears throat> meditation, first of all, look at mathematics. Every equation is an equation. What does it mean? It means balance. Anything that's scientific is about balance. What do I do when I meditate? It means that from this hectic life that we live in, this whole rat race full of suffering and war and death and people honking at me on the road and cutting me off and divorce and all of this, from all of this, I go into a state by myself with maybe at most probably just in a room or maybe out in the trees because with the trees or just by myself, I can be balanced because I exit the reality of all of these human beings that, as our friend pointed out earlier, that the, all of the suffering is caused just by this egoism. We have everything in reality to create the Garden of Eden here on earth. But the egoism just doesn't let us connect, doesn't let us arrange things. And truly, you can blame the billionaires, the ultra-wealthy, that they don't want to, you know, give it. 
we don't know how to organize it. And it would be better for them too. It would be better for each and every person if you would just organize things in the correct connections. We would feel balanced. We would, by the way, begin feeling an upper force. And when I meditate, I basically go away from this whole reality and feel myself at peace. What happens, and every meditator knows this, what happens five minutes later or five hours later, let's say, it doesn't matter. But the point is, as soon as I go back into life, although I feel better, but to the extent that I come out of that kind of shield, that sticking my head in the sand that I created or that unity with the universe that I created but didn't include human beings, I start feeling bad again and then I need to meditate again. So in short, Kabbalah says that meditation isn't enough. Why? Because what am I doing when I meditate? I'm organizing myself internally to be balanced, but I am ignoring the main aspect of our lives, which is balance with other human beings. If I can be balanced, if I know how to be an agent of balance in every situation in life, every door will just open up to me. People will feel it, that this is a person that can really create like harmony. This is what everything in reality, every particle is trying to feel itself balanced. I want to balance out with my surroundings. This is how all evolution occurred to try to be balanced. And this is what the whole universe is heading towards, balance. So if I ignore the human beings, and I can't be in a meditative state around human beings, uh, you know, or be like in some special f positive philosophy, you know, these people, you, you, if you see them, that they're really extreme into this, you know, they're not, they're not realistic, right? It's not realistic because you're ignoring the reality. So meditation isn't enough, but Kabbalah is a method by which I can truly come to balance, not only with the inanimate matter, that I'll only be able to do it by myself or only be able to do it when I'm finally up on a mountaintop. We can still enjoy it in the meantime. It's fine if people meditate, that's good, or do yoga, that's all great. But I still will be left with the need to balance with all of my surroundings. And the only reason why we don't do it or even talk about doing it or even consider it possible is because it's impossible, right? How can you do it? Yes, it is impossible, but only by an upper force that changes me internally. And this is what we draw from the wisdom of Kabbalah. This is what's unique about the wisdom of Kabbalah. It's the light that reforms, that brings me into a state that I can be at peace I can go give the State of the Union address. I can go talk to the United Nations. It doesn't matter. A Kabbalist can be anywhere and and be in balance with his reality. You can't tell what he's doing externally necessarily, but I can be this magnet of love, of, of all goodness. And therefore, meditation is just not enough. I need to expand it to include the whole reality and that's why there's no meditation in Kabbalah. In fact, Kabbalah is the opposite that I need to build around me instead of, instead of uh, close myself off. I need to actually come into contact with other people like I see many people wrote in. That's wonderful. And it's already coming out of myself a little bit and even asking a question and engaging and listening to other people. What are they thinking? Not just in my own minds, but listening to them and incorporating with them and building kind of a, a spiritual like greenhouse that we all desire this one thing and we're all moving towards it. Let's go to a question from Adam uh, from San Diego. Uh, you were speaking about the five worlds. Uh, were the five worlds before the Big Bang? Yes. The Big Bang is already considered our world that starts from this initial point but contains everything in it and then gradually develops to the point where we will be able to, again, climb up through these very same worlds. So I have Asiya. You can go ahead, Chris, if you have something to say. I'm just no, it's just the, the, there's the world's people. 
you know, a lot of times people get, uh, there's a misunderstanding about what a world is. It, does it mean that when we go to the different worlds, do we live the, leave this planet? Is there another semi-planet Earth and another semi-planet no. Earth? No, what and happens is that I conceal. First of all, we exist already. Actually, we exist already in the final state. But this state was concealed until I feel a point compared to the whole of reality. Just imagine in our universe, a single point compared to the entire universe. And that point that we feel, feel, feel is the entire universe. So not even just me, my body, but rather this point that I can somehow feel, and I don't feel anything really outside of my body, but that I can somehow feel that I'm existing in the same world with, all of that is considered this one point. And we gradually expand this point until we include this entire beautiful reality that looks ugly to me right now, but when it's because it's like um, unripe fruit. When I see it in, when I see only half the work, you know, when I see only half of the reality, I'm seeing the ugliest, filthiest, most disgusting part of reality that doesn't fit into the general system. I don't see the whole system and the causes for everything in life, and therefore it looks ugly to me. And I gradually lift these curtains and uh, reveal that reality and also begin operating that reality. Good. Uh, I think we need to wrap up right about now, Johnny. We have some uh, announcements. Uh, and I would like to say great questions, everybody. Um, it's been good to be with you. And let's go through these right now. Uh, you want me to read? Yeah, if you don't mind. Small type. Yeah. Your next lesson will be on Wednesday, April 22nd. You can watch the lesson at either 8 p.m. Eastern time or 8 p.m. Pacific time, as you are now. The primary textbook for all B'nai Baruch classes is Kabbalah for the student, this one here. The bookstore offers special packages for each semester that includes key books related to that semester. You can find them by going to the bookstore tab on the EC website or just kabbalahbooks.info. The student Q&A forum for our fundamental students is now open. I know we didn't get to a lot of the questions because we had technical difficulties, next time we will, but please put your questions in the forum. If you'd still like them answered, I'm there all the time answering questions and along with our other uh, moderators. Just click on the forum tab above the chat window, then scroll down until you see the Spring 2015 Fundamentals Forum. Questions go into a moderator queue for our instructors and moderator staff to answer so you will not see your question being posted immediately. We try to post the question and answer within 24 hours, but some questions may take longer. There are many services available to help you in your studies in addition to the classes. Recordings of the lessons will be posted within 24 hours of the class. You can find them on the archive tab above the chat window. If you have any questions, comments, or problems of any type, type, please send an email to ec at kabbalah.info. We have volunteers who will help you or make sure that your question gets routed to the right person. And with that, thank you for joining us. See you on Sunday, and we'll be back with me and Chris here. Uh, see you on Wednesday, Wednesday, and we'll see you here next Sunday. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.